Hi, it's uh, Ted Ritzer, host of the Greening Government Speaker Series uh, that uh, is presented by Alberta Environment and Parks, the Alberta Climate Change Office, and the um, Municipal Climate Change Action Center. And today we're fortunate, we're joined by Frank Bass, uh, who is uh, currently with a university in the Netherlands. I'm not sure I can uh, pronounce the name, uh, Frank, but uh, uh, Groningen University Groningen. in the Netherlands. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Frank has a, a pretty interesting background. Uh, so the format of the series usually goes, we kind of have a, uh, 40 minutes for presentation, followed by a 20 minutes Q&A uh, through the uh, webinar uh, chat screen. Uh, but Frank's uh, background, he's, uh, he uh, is a former U.S. Marine and still involved uh, in the U.S. Marines, uh, and also um, served with the Phoenix uh, Police Department for 20 years. And when I read some of the background on what you did with the Phoenix uh, Police Department, Frank, it was pretty interesting. Uh, you've managed the digital forensics investiga investigative unit, and that included um, um, forms of digital evidence, uh, looking at social media and, and criminal intelligence. And, and uh, you actually were an instructor uh, with the Arizona Law Enforcement Academy for a while. Is that right? I was. I was, correct. Excellent. And uh, so... Uh, now, Frank is with the uh, Faculty of Law. In fact, I think the, uh, the acronym is STEP. It's uh, Security Technology um, E-Privacy uh, Research Group. And you've got um, a project called CityCop, which is really sort of the core of the presentation today, Frank. So uh, with no more description, I'll uh, turn it over to you for a wonderful presentation. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks, Ted. Uh, uh, thanks for the intro. Um, as Ted mentioned, um, my name is Frank Pace, and I'm with the University of Groningen, the uh, Security Technology and E-Privacy uh, Research Group, which is a um, uh, falls under the Faculty of Law at the university. And I joined the university in uh, February of this past year, um, and that was after uh, 20 years of service with the Phoenix Police Department, as uh, Ted mentioned. Um, in, in brief, to describe my role, and that's going to lead into what I'm going to talk about today, um, the university, and, and particularly our research group, uh, uh, manages several EU-funded research projects, and uh, the majority of these are related to matters of security and technology, and of, and of course, uh, privacy there within. Um, my background in law enforcement over the 20 years I was with uh, the Phoenix Police Department, uh, was basically surrounding at the uh, last half of it uh, in investigations and intelligence. Um, and as Ted mentioned, I did have uh, a period of time of assignment at our uh, uh, training academy and uh, also uh, several uh, rotating assignments into our patrol division. Um, with my background in investigations, uh, the uh, last uh, couple years of my career uh, were with uh, um, reorganizing and establishing our digital forensic operations uh, within the organization uh, and also uh, participating um, with the cyber task force with our federal partners at the Federal Bureau of Investigation and then also with uh, our other counterparts at the U.S. Secret Service as well. Um, that led me into uh, my current role where I uh, got involved and as uh, many of you I'm sure are aware uh, cyber crime issues uh, related to the internet, uh, no, no boundaries, um, or jurisdiction for that matter. And that led me into some work with Interpol, which uh, led to my um, uh, affiliation and joining uh, my current group of colleagues at, at the university. Um, that being said, my current role involves managing uh, the projects that we have that are related and involve uh, law enforcement agencies and security service partners uh, throughout Europe. Um, and in particular, the project I'm gonna talk about today is the City Cup project, and, and Ted, Ted mentioned it briefly, and I think in the uh, intro, uh, there was some a brief description about it. And what I'll do is I'll get right into uh, sharing my screen that's gonna have the presentation here. Okay, 
So um, the City Cop project essentially um, is, let's go back out of here. The City Cop project is a project that involves, and I'll get right to the presentation. There we go. Okay, so uh, in essence, the City Cop project um, involves uh, 22 partners in 14 countries uh, throughout Europe. Um, two of those partners are non-EU, that being Serbia and uh, Norway. Um, and our partners are comprised of various academic institutions, civil uh, society organizations, other NGOs, and uh, industry. Um, the, the scope of, of the project, in essence, is as it lists up here on the screen that, that you can see, one is we want to find the best practices within law enforcement that work uh, towards uh, developing a common technical solution uh, for law enforcement throughout Europe um, that allows better engagement between law enforcement and the community um, to design an application um, to prepare the actual architecture and structure behind that. Uh, and then also, and what I think is going to be relevant to the uh, topic of, of, the, of this series that we're participating in, uh, series gaming and training. And what I'll focus on that, of course, is going to be how we will be providing training to the law enforcement officers, as well as our citizen participants as well. And this is something that's, of course, delivered remotely and can have many other facets of possibility, I think, uh, within uh, government uh, and in our case, and I think in the case of maybe some of you uh, listening, law enforcement. Um, as those different components of the project are developed, uh, we do get into a, a phase, which we'll be doing later this summer, uh, of pilot runs, in which we, we have four cities. I'll get into exactly who those are. Um, and then um, looking at, of course, um, with the uh, uh, focus of our, of our research group, is to have a privacy and data protection audit uh, and toolkit that are available. Now, um, you're seeing this more in the US and throughout North America, uh, concerns for uh, privacy, digital rights on the internet and so forth. Um, and within Europe, of course, you have the GDPR, the General Protection, uh, re re the, the General Data Protection Regulation, which is coming online in May of 2018. Um, and you have several other um, legislative instruments um, and policies at the national and EU level uh, which definitely are uh, privacy centric and are privacy by design. And that is something with this particular project we're looking to do as we help to build that trust and confidence between law enforcement and the community. Um, as I just mentioned, um, the community process, the community policing process um, involves four cornerstones. And, and that of course is trust, commitment, engagement, and mutual learning. And as anyone in law enforcement understands, um, the only success that you have um, in being able to successfully implement whether those are new uh, um, uh, projects, um, different methods of crime suppression, of community engagement, um, those only come with the trust between the organization and those that you serve and the understanding that the citizens feel and they, under, and they believe that there's a commitment on the part of the LEA that is delivering or is establishing that relationship with its community or rebuilding it in, in many cases. Um, and then mutual learning. And that's something that I'll touch on briefly with our uh, serious gaming. And I'll get a little bit more into exactly what that is and, and, how, and how it looks as well. Uh, when we look at the law enforcement uh, agencies, um, here in the City Cop Project, we have six cities uh, and, and LEAs that are participants, uh, those being um, South Yorkshire in the UK, uh, Lower Saxony in Germany, uh, Bucharest, Romania with the Romanian National Police, the Municipal Police of Florence in Italy, uh, Municipal Police in uh, France, and then also the PSP uh, National Police um, in Portugal. And the key thing to take away from this slide that you're looking at is that the agencies that are that are our partners and that are participating in this in this project are of varying uh, uh, types and have varying levels of responsibility 
to those that they serve. Obviously, they are at the national, state, and municipal level. And of course, as you see within uh, Canada and the U.S., whether you're at the provisional level or the uh, province level, or if you're at the state or local level, uh, each has a different responsibility. And that's a key part to the understanding of how a single solution could potentially uh, work throughout Europe. And the idea being that if this could work in Europe, certainly we might be able to have a platform, and that is what the toolkit is, that's the toolkit part of the project, to be able to have that work in other parts of the world. And so you see a glimpse of that from the, um, the, the, the broad scope of different types of agencies that we have as uh, partners. When we look at the concerns, and when I say concerns and requirements, what I'm about to show right now, as part of our research into uh, both the uh, law enforcement and citizen side, uh, we, I conducted uh, one hour interviews uh, with the representatives from each one of the agencies and that not only included the sworn and, uh, uh, officers and officials of the agency, but also uh, civilian employees as well. And those that were involved in community engagement, those that are involved in IT particularly, because this involves when you develop a, a solution like this. And if anyone has had any experience in trying to take whether that's an off the shelf product or something else from a vendor and being able to integrate that with your existing infrastructure, um, uh, you obviously have to have not only the approval of, but you have to have the uh, ICT or IT section uh, involved at the at the uh, very beginning of that and at the onset. And so when we conducted these interviews, uh, we wanted to gauge what the uh, concerns were of the agency on, on what is working for them, what is not. We wanted to better understand uh, what they would like to see, what their desires were uh, coming into a, a project like this. And then being able to help them develop that into a technical solution. And when we look at what the results of that were, well, the obvious is, is that they wanted it to be able to improve their existing mechanisms and abilities to communicate with the population. Um, second to that, uh, they had concerns for increased workload. And what this means is that with any type of new platform, new project that uh, you take on as an organization, not only do you have to be concerned with budgetary uh, requirements related to the acquisition and installation uh, and use of, of such technology and reoccurring costs that can come with that, but you also have to have concern for if it's as successful as you think it's going to be, you're going to have more work as a result. And when we go back to that trust, uh, if the community is putting their trust in us and, and in law enforcement to be able to uh, do our jobs more effectively, then the agencies were expressing, we want to be able to know that we'll be able to handle that increase in work. Um, additionally, when you look at the broken windows theory, when you look at low level crimes that truly have an impact in the perception on citizens perception of crime, um, this is where they really wanted to ensure that one thing that we were successful at was helping to address criminal quality of life issues. Uh, those are key components to any type of crime suppression project. When we look at it from a management perspective, what are the citizens' perceptions of, of how well uh, their police force is working? Uh, a lot of it has to do with visibility, and that visibility also means not just in how many officers that they see out on the street every day, but what is the uh, visibility of the community like? Is there a lot of graffiti? Are there a lot of abandoned vehicles? Are, are they seeing... Um, evidence of other types of property crime and blight. And in some of the citizen research, which I have several slides I'm going to expand on, uh, this is where those two intersect, where people believe that even if the crime levels in their, in their neighborhoods are low, but you see more visibility of issues like I had just mentioned, they feel less safe. They feel that there may be more crime present. And so these are issues that the agencies were concerned and they wanted to be able to ensure that we could help address that. Um, awareness of cultural and generational attitudes. What this focuses on is the fact that as technology evolves, um, as, as we have new methods of communication um, um, in, in all aspects of our, our, of our lives, um, not everyone is uh, either capable uh, of keeping up with that monetarily um, or just because of where they're at in life. And that, and that may mean uh, whether 
um, it's truly an economic issue or if it's one of just uh, culture where um, if you're a senior citizen and you're very accustomed to when you want to um, speak to somebody and let's just say that it's an unfortunate time that you have to go speak to an officer, you have to file a police report. Um, although a concern and there's something that I'll talk about here shortly uh, are requirements for some agencies, but in often, in, in often the case, um, people want to have that face-to-face -face interaction. And even if they do not have, or even if they have a smartphone, just because they have it doesn't necessarily mean that they would want to use this type of, of a uh, channel to be able to communicate with law enforcement. So we wanted to ensure that whatever we're going to take on as an agency, and this is the, from their perspective, whatever they were going to take on, that it didn't interfere with or otherwise confuse or negate the traditional methods by which all members of the community are able to interact with and, and receive the same level of service uh, from, from law enforcement. Looking at the need for localization, uh, this is something that addresses um, the point about having both municipal and national level law enforcement as part of this project. Um, at a national level, um, you're not dealing with many of the uh, minute matters that are down at the um, macro level when it comes to dealing with issues of um, uh, uh, minor crimes or traffic um, dealing with issues uh, as a first responder, oftentimes that's not at the national level. However, it does not mean that national police do not want to have or need to have communication. Of course they do. And in many countries, the national police uh, run the full spectrum of on the ground work, just as any municipal police force, uh, uh, force does. And also at the federal level, which would normally in the case of um, in Canada, the, the RCMP or in the US, the FBI, uh, or state police, um, they have, they covered that full spectrum. And that was something where this was particularly important to the municipal uh, uh, departments to ensure that whatever level of service this application, this platform provides, it does so understanding what the scope of their authority is. Um, importance of geolocation, technically what we'll talk about here is that with most um, smartphone technology, smartphone apps, um, as you're aware, you have the ability to provide your location via, via the GPS through the uh, phone provider. And when it comes to using something that interacts with the police, the, the police wanted to ensure that one for emergencies, just as you do when you call 911 in, the, in most of Europe, it's 112 or 999. When you call the emergency number that the authorities are receiving your location, especially in the event that you're not able to speak, um, Two, if you're using this app and you're in an unfamiliar location, so you're from the US, you're from Canada, and you go into Florence, you go into Bucharest, these are cities that you've never been to before, and you had your wallet stolen, your passport stolen, and you wanna be able to interact with the authorities and you wanna start that process by being able to give your location when filing this type of information. This is something where this type of a platform, this application will be able to get the location that you're at, provide that, and that would be an acceptable reporting procedure for the uh, reporting process. And so those are two examples of how geolocation could provide uh, a service both to the agency and to the uh, citizen and to the uh, visitor. Also for matters of notification, which we're gonna talk about, being able to be notified of certain events in the area that you're in so that you'll know that it's relevant to where you're at. Uh, and then also for uh, receiving pieces of information. So if you need to know where a local fire station is, hospital, et cetera, you would know exactly what the distance is and being able to get a map function to work to help get you there. Looking at real-time data access. Um, from a management perspective, being able to gauge the uh, use and, and have measurables against um, just how successful or not such an application is, you need to have access to data. And as, as would be expected, and as part of, of what we're developing, this data would include the types of incidents that are being reported, the types of um, engagements that the, that the uh, agencies have with the users of the app. However, we would, we would ensure uh, that this is uh, focused with privacy in mind, uh, that there is at, at least pseudo anonymity or uh, 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 not only privacy, but the ability to remain anonymous if possible. And then also uh, to, to ensure the protection of that, of that data that is, that is being used by, by the agency. 
Um, and then looking at the whole approach philosophy, uh, this is something that uh, we, we learned from our, our colleagues in Germany and the whole approach philosophy. And this goes back to when uh, the, the research was conducted on what we in North America from an Anglo-Saxon model would look at as community policing, similar in the UK, um, other agencies in other parts of the world um, in, the, uh, in Portugal, for instance, it's referred to as proximity policing. Um, there's different terms for essentially what is community engagement. And in Germany, their approach to this is by being offered to, to uh, try and provide the citizens um, with all services available within the scope of law enforcement and outside of law enforcement. So for instance, in dealing with domestic violence, dealing with bullying and school issues where not only does, do, the, do the police deal with the criminal matters, but there's also the approach of being able to put them in touch with those uh, with health services and being able to uh, deal with uh, child protective services or deal with housing issues, et cetera. So that's the whole approach is to engage the community, not only from a police perspective, but from a municipal perspective, from a government perspective. And what is it, what other services does the government have that if the police are your first contact, they can help you get the type of help that you need. Um, looking at what the core functionalities came that, that we devised uh, from those discussions, and essentially the, the four topics were communication, reporting, notification, and resources. And when we look at, when we look at communication, es essentially all the LEAs, all the agencies across the spectrum, even though it's not necessarily related to community policing, wanted to know that they that any user of this type of an application would be able to reach them in an emergency one two reporting um, for citizens to be able to in some context be able to have communication with the agency whether that's through a formal crime complaint or if that's just to provide um, an anonymous tip uh, or other type of information and ultimately where we've come with this and where this has evolved in our research in our in our discussions both with the citizens and, and with the with law enforcement is that at a community engagement level, having the ability for citizens to uh, communicate directly with uh, those officers directly responsible for community engagement. So community policing officers, proximity policing officers, PCSOs as they're called in the UK, uh, whatever the term is, being able for citizens to help start a conversation. And then for the officer then to say, well, this is based on their experience, uh, this is gonna be a resource in another part of the government that can help you, or if this is a police matter, yes, I can certainly help you with that and kind of be a, um, a, a, a person, a, a human element to being able to provide that level of care, and whether that's going to be actually just filing a report or being able to help with a civil uh, dis, dis, dispute within the neighborhood, whatever the matter is, and having that one-on-one -on -one in, engagement. And then the notifications. Um, this was, as, as I'll show in some of our research, very popular uh, in that we wanted to be able to provide something outside the scope of what you normally see on emergency no notifications. So for instance, most governments have an ability to provide disaster notification messages to be able to provide um, messages related to missing persons uh, and so forth. And that's all done at the state or national level. What this is meant to be is a notification system at the local level, at, the, at, at, at most at, at the state level, where the agency can provide updates on traffic matters. Um, there could be major events that are occurring, uh, for instance, sporting events, other types of cultural events, and being able to have people be, have a uh, ability to decide what it is that they're going to be notified of, and then based on that geolocation that I was explaining, being able to be notified when they're in an area. So, for instance, you can choose if you're a citizen of one of our four cities. So we'll take uh, Bucharest, for example, and you want to know that if there's any major traffic dis dis disruptions, that's all that you'll be notified of. And in fact, whenever you're outside of the city of Bucharest, you won't be notified unless you choose to. If you are within a specific geographic region of the city, you can determine based on your location, you can, uh, uh, what we're hoping to have, is an ability to actually geofence the particular areas that you would want to know. And so those are all different uh, um, types of notification that you could receive. 
and resource listings. Uh, as I had mentioned, uh, being able to look on a map based on where you're at, where certain government facilities are and other locations that could provide the type of information that you would expect to receive from any type of government application. When we look at what this evolved into and where we're at, you're gonna have a look and, and, and I'm one to really not do death by PowerPoint and I know I'm gonna have a lot of slides here and I'll try and be as visual about it as possible. But looking at what this has evolved into from those four core functions that I described, that's resulted in what you see in the middle of the column our processes, which are an SOS emergency button, the information report, uh, our notification system, and our information. Um, on the right column, it just gives you a little bit more of an explanation. An e-form is essentially an email, uh, a notification that would go from your phone directly to the organization for them to act on. Uh, a push not notification is a simple notification that comes whenever your phone is on and on its mobile network. And then, as I described for our resources, uh, uh, different map listings. Now, what I'm going to get into here, uh, we have a colleague, Celia Callis from Nutcracker Research in the United Kingdom, um, conducted citizen focus groups. And in these citizen focus groups, um, we had an objective was to engage the citizens um, and understand their mindset and their reactions to the proposals that are coming from, from our uh, project. And as you can see, you know, what's their perception of safety? You know, what is their perception of the local police? Um, what would they want and, or what would they consider as something that would um, have them keep such an application on their phone? And then you look at the other side and does that meet their expectations and how likely they would consider using something? And so, um, the research was done in many of the cities that we have our, um, our law enforcement partners in and where our pilots are going to be conducted. And as you can see on the slide here in Bucharest, Florence, uh, Hanover, Lisbon, Lyon, and in Sheffield. Um, these are both media, they're all in essence uh, media, uh, medium sized uh, uh, cities in Europe. And um, culturally, they run the gamut. And so that was something where we wanted to ensure that whether you're an Eastern European culture that has had historically um, varying levels of relationships with their police, um, or whether you're a, a very established community policing focused agency that has been doing so for quite some time, like you see in the United Kingdom, we wanted to get a good gauge of the different types of um, perceptions and attitudes towards police and, and this project. And as you can see towards the bottom, um, we ensured that diversity included citizens, all adults between 18 and 65, um, blue collar, white collar, with or without children, um, and all had to, uh, of course, have a smartphone and they had to have an understanding of what applications were. Obviously, we wouldn't get too far with the questioning related to a mobile application if, if that weren't the case. And also the non-rejectors of communicating with the police, um, that essentially means that uh, we didn't want to have um, not necessarily someone that uh, doesn't like the police. We, you know, we, we certainly did have those that had less than a favorable relationship with law enforcement, but not those that were completely unwilling to ever engage because then that may skew the results as far as having um, no real um, data to collect on, on, on what their engagement is currently or what it was historically. And so we had some parameters in there where we did not want to have uh, current officers themselves or their family members necessarily, but uh, we also did not want to have the other side of the uh, um, spectrum on that. Looking at the uh, citizen mindsets, um, it, we actually uh, were pleasantly surprised in, 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 in what we found. I know coming from the U.S., um, it, it's been a very tough couple of years in the United States in law enforcement, and, and looking at what you see throughout, I think, the world uh, globally, um, not much different, but uh, what we did find is that um, there's citizens' perceptions on safety um, <clears throat> was that they relatively felt safe. And um, when you look at this current slide, um, you know, whereas they thought criminal activity was localized and contained within certain areas, um, they didn't normally feel as though they were put into those types of positions. Um, and the last cloud that you see really points out one of the key aspects of what most citizens felt would be uh, the most uh, desirable reason to have such an application. One would be 
to ensure or have a, a better uh, a feeling of safety for their loved ones, for, for their parents, for their children, and knowing that if they had a, an ability to, to uh, be located maybe quickly, more, more quickly, to be, to be able to um, get types of emergency services or be able to have interaction with law enforcement when they needed to, this was something that, that was uh, of a concern to the citizens that, that were interviewed. Um, when we look at what the citizens' perceptions were towards the local police, they were, they, were, they were sympathetic. They were understanding of the cutbacks that police currently have to deal with, and that is in every country. Um, they were aware of the politics that are involved, um, even uh, outside of the scope of what you see in the U.S. Um, every country has got its politics behind what occurs. Um, they were aware of that, and they were, they were aware and, and, and made clear, and this was in all countries, this wasn't in just one particular country, um, that police are under-resourced and, 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 and dealing with a lot of minor crimes. And what can be difficult, of course, is not having enough police and having too many calls um, they were concerned, and this is where just as much law enforcement had the concern for increased workload, so did the citizens. They were keenly aware that um, if something were to be um, this successful, is it really going to have a negative impact? Is it really going to decrease law enforcement's ability to uh, provide services? And when we look at their psychological distance from local police and what perceptions cause those, um, when they when citizens have uh, a perception that they don't see the police as much that feels like they are more distant and that, that, that there isn't as much engagement which I, you know obviously there there is not um, and there was a small minority that uh, were, were using Facebook and other social media channels um, and I think that's growing and I think in many of the cities uh, there was at least several thousand if not uh, 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 tens of thousands of users but uh, when you look at that from a, 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 a city of uh, 500,000 or more or in a, in, a, in a country of several million, uh, you're really just scratching the surface. And um, this is something where from an application point of view and from a project point of view, when we look at is this going to be redundant to what social media provides? To some extent, yes, but that's not a bad thing because not everybody, as our research showed, is on social media but they do have smartphones. And so this may fill that gap. Um, when we look at the implications, um, you know, the citizens were very key that, uh, you know, trust is very important to them and that, um, you know, they, they, they really do want to have more presence of law enforcement um, and they want to have and are definitely open to having more channels that would help them engage with. And I think when you look at it from a generational perspective, one of the things that was key was that from our younger uh, participants, of course, they are more, much more likely, uh, as they do in every other aspect of their lives and in their communications with their family and friends, um, to want to have uh, nonverbal communication, to be able to text, to be able to have messaging systems in place, um, and then we also saw that from the older adults as well. Uh, it, I think it was the awareness that we saw from those that were from 18 to 30, but actually the majority of our middle-aged participants were very much um, keen to have more channels available to them to uh, be able to engage and improve that level, that perception of uh, safety. Um, and looking at the city cop uh, uh, project and, 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 and what it could offer to them, um, they definitely won. Um, they had two aims. One, they want to, of course, increase your level of safety, and they want to bring the police within reach. Um, the thing about this, so bring, bringing the police within reach, is uh, you'll see in the results, sometimes expectations are hard to, to, to live up to. One of the things is response times, and I think there's a perception that if you're using what we call an SOS button on a mobile phone, um, that this could potentially, I think, in the minds of some of our participants, provide faster service when the reality is that, of course, law enforcement is constrained by uh, the same measure of personnel and staffing issues, regardless of the method by which somebody contacts them. And that's one of our concerns in the project as well as, as it was from, from law enforcement, was that 
if there was an, uh, an understanding or it was understandable for someone to expect the same level of service, but an increased level of service was something, at least from the emergency perspective, was concerning because we want to be able to provide that. And I think the uh, agencies themselves, of course, would. Uh, response times that are above four or five minutes, whatever the standards are in those particular countries, um, they're always trying to bring that down. And hopefully by the reduction in other areas, especially with reporting, the hope is that this would then result in more personnel being freed on the ground to respond to uh, more serious crimes. Um, looking at the uh, features that are that are unique and what the citizens uh, thought were uh, appealing to them, the geo tracking, um, of course, they, they felt that this was uh, something that was important in, in being able to provide a level of service, the option to send photos. Um, one of the things that our application will do is, as I'll explain, is the app, when you do provide information to the agency uh, that you're reporting to, you will be able to provide uh, both photos and uh, videos. Um, and, and oftentimes, um, even if it may not be as part of a criminal report, if you're still just trying to convey a message by showing something to the community policing officer, i.e. vandalism, um, this would certainly help that. Now would help the officer be able to address those issues more promptly uh, as opposed to it just being uh, a report sitting in the queue. Um, one of the appeals of, of the app um, by perceived benefits, um, of course, uh, for citizens to be able to not only uh, use the emergency feature that could, that could free up for other reporting mechanisms, but also looking at the ability to report these minor crimes. I, I just kind of touched on that when I had mentioned that if you can report these minor incidents without having to engage the call takers and the 911 operators uh, directly, um, then that would free them up to be more available for the more serious crimes. Um, and I think that is going to be a, an absolute reality. One of, the, um, one, of the, one of the processes that we're currently involved in and I'm gonna to touch on are uh, uh, city visits uh, before our pilots are gonna begin in, in, in Portugal, or I'm sorry, in Sheffield, we'll be in Portugal uh, in a couple of weeks. In Sheffield, uh, we did visit their command and control center, their dispatch operations, and we definitely could see where the functions that deal with the non-emergency uh, reporting um, would be definitely freed up by the ability to have something that could be shuffled through directly down to the uh, precinct level uh, to be able to provide a level of service as opposed to the uh, actual voice calls having to be taken. And so this was something that the citizens recognized as well. Um, the most appealing functions, of course, were the emergency and the police to citizen. Now, uh, this is where citizens felt that these two functions alone would be most important and to them keeping, uh, to, to download the app and, and to keep it and the police to citizen being the most prominent of those. And that's because we would hope that if you have a police app like City Cop, uh, you don't have to use it all the time. However, uh, it would be able to provide information to you. And that would be something where when people look at their phones, and I think we all do this because we're concerned about memory and, and, and battery usage, et cetera, and we're deleting and downloading apps depending on what, what we use or don't use. Um, something that provides police to citizen communication would be worthy as the citizens felt in our research to keep this app on there because they know that from time to time they're gonna receive the notifications that they feel are important to them based on the criteria that they selected. Um, looking at that, as I, as I just pointed out, um, one of the things that was of concern, of course, was the protection of data. And that's something that we see here when it's, it's when we talk about the majority that they trust the information will be secure, but they need to know that it won't be passed on to third parties. And that's something I think, if there's any level of trust or confidence that we currently have in, in government is that um, when you provide personally identifying information, that that information is not being resold. It is not being given to uh, other entities to be uh, available for open source, for marketing, et cetera. Um, that was one of the issues and one of the requirements that the citizens would have is that, they, that we could ensure a level of data protection. And the obvious, uh, looking at the app from a citizen perspective, it needed to be simple to use. It, uh, it needed to um, have geo-tracking that could be used selectively. So for instance, the emergency feature, that is something where it would always be used. However, on reporting, 
or for the notification aspect, um, the citizens wanted to know that they would have the ability to turn this on and off. As much as they trusted the police, they don't necessarily need to know that the police know where they're at all the time. So this was something that, that was important to them. And then that third point kind of talks to what I mentioned about the emergency response being as quick or quicker than calling 112. And then looking at the conclusions, um, as I just kind of touched on all of it, um, it needs to meet those emotional needs and, 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 and safeguards of personal safety. And then it needs to also uh, be something that provides a daily well-being. And that's uh, something that was across the board from the citizens' perspective. And these are two points that I just mentioned as well. And um, above all, the data storage, as I just talked on, um, the ease of use, uh, the ability to personalize the preferences, i.e. the geolocation that I talked about, um, the prompt response of the police, and the manual activation of geotracking. Okay, so that's from the citizen perspective. Uh, we heard a little bit uh, about the law enforcement perspective and what does this all mean and how are we going to make this work and how is this going to function when we deliver this to the communities that are part of our project. Um, looking at the locations where we will be piling, um, the first is going to be in Bucharest. Uh, Bucharest um, uh, will begin as they all do at some point in July of this coming year. Um, that will be followed by Sheffield in the United Kingdom, um, then uh, Florence, Italy, and then of course Lisbon in Portugal. And as you can see, we essentially touched the four corners essentially of Europe almost, and we have a, a, a wide variety of, of, of agencies there. And one of the things that we're learning uh, in our pre-pilot visits, which I'm going to talk about, is that every requirement is different. And that's something that's a, a key aspect of this project and I think would be the same. And that's part of what we would have as our, uh, our deliverables from this research for any city, any government that would be looking to uh, implement this type of a solution. And really what we're looking at and what, we've, what we have found over the last uh, year or so of this project is that we're not just developing a single app for all of Europe or for, for all of North America or all of Asia. We're developing a platform and a lot of the things that come into mind with that is that uh, identity. Um, uh, in talking to our partners in Lisbon and we may soon have partners coming on board in Spain, um, one of the, the uh, important aspects is that the the app is called something that is reflective, not only of the language, um, but also of the culture, the, uh, whether that's national identity um, uh, images or so forth that, I, that associate the app with the country that, that you're in. Um, the app will have language capabilities, of course, but sometimes legally, there are certain things that one country can allow and others do not. And so what we're looking at and what our research is gonna show is that Outside of those four core functionalities, which I think everyone, every partner in each of the countries that participated in agreed to, there are certain aspects that have to be customized. And that is something that's going to be an end result of what we're finding as we go into our pilots. So the pilots are broken into uh, two groups. We have the citizens and the, and the law enforcement uh, agencies. The citizen groups will be reflective of those that are currently being interviewed and have been for the research I just showed you. Then there will also be those that'll be uh, in a real time usage of the app when it's downloaded. And the law enforcement, uh, uh, the agencies themselves, of course. Um, evaluation and pilot. Now, with the evaluation, we have a prototype that is uh, nearly ready. And when that comes out, we're going to have a period of um, giving this to our our testers within the agencies and within our citizen groups to have a first look. Um, help us not only with bugs and so forth, but also for look and feel to ensure that we're getting that intuitive use or ability of it. Um, and then from there to have our pilot. Um, the pilot that itself is going to include uh, the application, our serious games, which I'm going to talk about, and training. And the training is related to uh, the backend portal. So for these mobile applications or for this mobile application, there's going to be an ability for citizens to go online and use an online version of it that's just like the phone version. And then the receiving end 
for law enforcement, there's going to be a portal system that allows them to have a closer look and to be able to receive the messages to, to map out the, the different occurrences and so forth. There's training behind that. And part of the training is going to involve uh, remote delivery, which I think is a key aspect to being able to provide, especially in a project like this, which spans an entire continent, um, and an ability to, to give this information to all partners and to any country that, that takes this on without having to always be, phys be physically present. Um, we'll be beginning our evaluation period um, between March and June of this, this year, so that's coming up. And then we're gonna be having our pilots in uh, the late summer. So from July through September is when we'll actually be starting to pilot them, them themselves. And when we look at the citizen pilot, what we want to take from that is an ability to, to measure that ability for the uh, for the communication if it is improved with the uh, police uh, to measure their citizen perceptions and to evaluate the effectiveness of whatever new type of reporting capability um, is is uh, put forth on the application and then provide that feedback and that real-time data that i talked about back back to the agencies um, for the law enforcement side um, again same thing want to be able to measure the effectiveness of their improved communication to evaluate their awareness of citizen perceptions and the reporting, just as it is with the uh, citizens and the effectiveness of those notifications. We want to know how effective it is that the information they provide is, is having some impact. And to evaluate the backend systems, which is the, the portal that will be uh, available to the uh, LEAs. Now, the mobile application, as I mentioned, it's going to have two forms. Essentially, it'll be an online version or an, an, an online version of portal that you could access through your computer or you can do it through your mobile phone. Um, we just went through the requirements for the LEAs and looking at, let's see if I can get through. Let's just get right to So looking at how the mobile application looks, um, we have a home screen. And right now, what you're looking at is the beta version, which um, is lacking a couple of things. One is um, any real character to the application right now. Um, as you'll see at the very top there, we have the term one city. Well, the name city cop is the name of the project. That is not gonna be the name of the mobile application. If you were to look at Google Play or an iTunes or the App Store, you would find there's a completely non-related application called city cop that's not going to be us so as i refer to the uh, uh requirements to have cultural identity and so forth um that's one of the things that we're still working on but for now we came up with the name one city and so what you're looking at is something where it shows the pure functionality and that being that the user uh, can choose to log in and register um they uh can see on there very very uh, prominently one, that there's the emergency button that can be used at any point. Um, and then also uh, what's important is the privacy policy. And that's something where anyone that has any concerns of interactions with the government, they can see very clearly what the use of the data is gonna be, what the data protection requirements are and so forth. And that'll be visible to them. Um, from the main menu, you'll have your ability to provide a report, to see notifications, information, and then of course, adjust your settings. Um, this is what the emergency feature is going to look like. Um, this has several capabilities, one of which is that it can be just a link to the existing 911 call system to where it just provides a, a call, or this would be able to provide more, very much more precise geolocation data um, that is constantly pinging, as the, the term goes, constantly pinging while the phone is in use to the agency's portal system. So if you're uh, in a dispatch center and you are equipped and you have decided as one of our agencies to use this aspect of this feature, um, whereas uh, normally uh, communication systems provide intermittent uh, geolocation data that is uh, based off of tower, this would incorporate uh, GPS information as well. Um, and that it also is doing a constant uh, stream, which it does on most cell phone providers uh, that are in any service that calls in an emergency number. Um, but with this, it would have a direct connectivity back to the mapping portal 
um, on the back end system to the LEA, but the user doesn't know any different. It does the same thing that the emergency button has always done, calling 911 has always done, but we make it very clear to them that their false use of any type of emergency service is a, is a crime. Um, you have to not only hit the button, but then you have to slide the call 112 to the right. So this isn't something where you'll be having a lot of um, accidental usage uh, of, of the uh, system. Um, looking at the slide on the right, you'll see that you have to physically stop it uh, once you're in it. So uh, for instance, uh, you, everything will appear red. So this screen will be on. If you were to be in any other part of the app, you would see that on the, on the top there, uh, everything turns red. Uh, you'll know that you're currently in that emergency state. And then from our main menu again, reporting. Now, one of the thoughts are, and this is where, as we are in this, this testing phase of trying to develop exactly what it is that our partners want. As you can see here, we had uh, um, buttons where somebody could start a, a, a flow, a workflow process of having to type as little as possible. So basically, if you hit the reporting feature, you look at the both the picture and the uh, uh, wording, which would be the language of your choice from the settings that you would have available to you, um, and be able to start that process of reporting. Now, where we evolve into is this may become much, much more generalized, so that one thing that we would make clear, as is a requirement for some of our agencies that are, uh, that are partnering with us, is that you still have to come in person. And whereas some agencies in some countries allow completely online reporting, others do not. And so that's where we're gonna have some changes. But for instance, you could provide uh, uh, information related to any one of those that's not you as the victim um, that you're just trying to provide. So for instance, if you were to report, uh, maybe not a serious crime such as a sexual assault, but you are trying to help someone um, with an anonymous tip related to uh, something that you believe is of criminal in nature occurring on your block, you could provide that. Um, if you believe you witnessed a violent crime, you could click on that, um, property crime, et cetera. So that's where the categories are being somewhat narrowed down. And when you see on the slides here, um, we would start this process where you begin filling out the form and then you would have a narrative description area where you could fill that in, you would submit it, and then uh, you could also, as I had previously mentioned, you could attach a file, take a picture. Um, one of the key aspects that I think this could evolve into, and many agencies have to deal with this, is the reporting of vehicle accidents, uh, being able to deal with property damage, where if you can limit the, uh, the need for an officer to respond to something that is, does not involve injury or, or serious damage, um, all the information could be potentially provided in this type of a structure, including uh, any pictures or video that would be necessary. And that could be included that when the person, if they have to go into the station, would spend that much less time at the station. Or if you're in a place where you don't have to do that, potentially you could have everything you need provided by just the application itself. So these are some of the abilities that the reporting feature would have in it. Um, the example here I'm showing is uh, from the United Kingdom. Um, you're seeing the uh, application report essentially would populate, which is on the right hand side, a screenshot of the non emergency reporting mechanism that's already um, available to citizens of the United Kingdom in Sheffield. And so this would be an example of we've decided that since they already have this capability, it's very much a um, lengthy form to fill out do we want to do this or do we want to have something where um, you simply provide this information that goes into a form that then goes in an email format. Now, a good example of how this currently works in Romania, uh, most of their record management system is still completely paper-based. They do have an ability to file a report online, to uh, communicate via email, but this all does at some point get physically printed and put into their systems. So, for Romania, this is something that's going to work in accordance with their current capabilities. For the UK, because they have such numerous ways of providing or, or, or uh, uh, pro taking a type of report uh, that would be filed, whether that's through um, fraud, 
they have an action fraud site or are going through something that's related to property crime that goes directly to the agency where you live. Um, this may be something where we just want to have the information go directly to the community uh, police. You waving at me, Ted? Uh, well, I wanted to uh, interject one comment uh, that's been reported uh, in the national news this week within Canada. There was an incident where uh, a, a person on a bus, an elderly woman, was subjected to verbal abuse. There was another person who was yelling obscenities at this elderly woman. But what was the most bizarre was there was a person on the bus who actually recorded uh, the incident on her smartphone and posted it to social media, but did not report it to any police forces. And uh, the chief of police for the city that this incident happened in, in Canada, uh, was interviewed and he said, well, that's, uh, that's the, the weird sort of situation right now is, a lot of people uh, are more likely to sort of uh, film something happening and post it to social media, but not actually engage in reporting that incident to their local police force. So I think what you've just described, Frank, would absolutely provide a, a, a response or a, a solution uh, to, to that incident. Uh, have you got any comments for the folks listening? Yeah, I think, Ted, you're right. Um, you're, you're seeing that uh, some folks are hesitant at times uh, to contact the uh, police with information uh, uh, or, or evidence of a crime that, that, they, that they may have. Um, this would provide an avenue for them to do that, one, by the measures I'm showing you, but then also when you look at the ability to um, look at, say, the anonymous tip. And um, yes, you could post this to the department's social media page, but um, in a matter of seconds, you could simply um, provide a one sentence uh, email uh, with an attachment of a video that goes directly to the agency. You could explicitly state you do not want contact. And then the agency would have that information directly, not have to wait for it to come out on the evening news. Well, and I guess the other question that I'll pose on behalf of our uh, uh, law enforcement agencies within Alberta, is there a, a, a an opportunity for police forces uh, from North America to, to participate or collaborate with you, Frank? Yes, there is. And one of, the, um, one of the abilities of the Horizon 2020 program, which is the uh, branch of the uh, European Union's uh, um, funding source for these types of projects is that we can have partners from outside the union um, and that one of the uh, results um, and deliverables that we have is to have interaction with uh, partners that are that are outside of the project. And uh, a good example of that, although it's still in Europe, is uh, we were contacted by the Spanish uh, uh, government that um, has an existing platform called Alert Cops. Um, and they looked at what City Cop is and what it's currently offering and a lot of the research that um, we have already conducted and they may soon become a partner with us as well. And that is something that I think the European Commission um, wants us to be able to promote and be able to say as a European, as an EU project, that we are um, not only doing what's good for the whole of Europe, but I think globally as well. And um, the, as you saw, one of the main uh, core points of the project is to develop a toolkit. And a toolkit is something that would be a package that would come and how that's gonna look and feel, I can't quite describe it yet, but it's going to be both administrative and I think personnel based to where we could take the findings of this project, both in the research and on the technical side, and be able to give that to any um, uh, future interested party and to help them establish this. And I think one of the things that we're finding is that um, you can have a multitude of different types of technical products out there that do something like what I'm describing. And some, quite honestly, that, that have many more robust features. And I think that's something where you'll see an evolution here. But what we are developing is the ability to have, as I described, a platform that allows you to take this, not just within multiple countries, but sometimes just within states or provinces within your own. And to be able to have something that is unique 
but then also can have a central control system where that can have an ability to have a structure behind it. And I think a lot of the interest that we're seeing as well is just in our research. And when you look at um, the uh, information that I was showing you um, from our citizen research portions, we've also had other partners um, from Bulgaria and Italy uh, that have conducted uh, research with uh, hundreds of other citizens and uh, law enforcement officials uh, uh, throughout the world, including uh, the U.S., Australia, um, that uh, have been, that are part of our project. And I think that would be something that we would absolutely would love to be able to share because why reinvent the wheel? Why go back and have to find information that we've already gone out um, over the course of a three-year project and have as a deliverable that we could share with law enforcement? We would be glad to do that. Well, well, Frank, I'd like to open it up uh, to folks to be able to pose questions through the online Q&A uh, window, which you can find through sort of hovering at the bottom uh, uh, on your screen. And so far, we don't have any questions posed, but I would encourage participants to pose any questions that they would like you to consider, Frank. Yeah, you know, you know what I'll do, Ted, is I'm going to... Um I'm going to get right to a, a portion of the presentation, which I think would be of interest. And okay, let me just get here. So let's get, and we're almost done here. Um, yeah. On the serious gaming, uh, I, I don't have a multitude of slides, but uh, this is directly from um, one of our recent presentations. And this this slide, I'm, I, I apologize for the graphic, but uh, we have we have. Two versions of it. So first we have the face matching game, and this is on the citizen side. And essentially this is showing um, a method by which we could help citizens become better at playing games that um, help them identify individual faces. And to be able to, one, um, this is completely customizable to where you can create the, the faces that you want to have someone else help you with and interact, or you can have the system do it for you. Um, and then on the second part of that is the identification game. And this would be at a citizen level to be able to help better understand um, what the law enforcement officers are going to ask of them when they have to engage with reporting a crime that involves a suspect. Um, for, for the LEAs, um, one of the key things that we came up with um, was an actual scenario-based uh, application where the LEA develops the scenarios. Now, we currently have several of our partners that have developed a full suite of community-based policing problems um, and different types of incidents that uh, officers encounter for our project. However, the format behind the solution itself is that it would be completely customizable. And the idea is you take a city, um, you design it the way you want it based on the types of um, types of uh, locations, whether those are sporting events or schools or hospitals, um, and then you create the incidents and you would have a choice of characters. And then once the, once the city is created and then it's populated, then the scenarios start, which uh, then require the user, the officer, to then provide a series of answers based on the incident that they're seeing. So for instance, there could be a, uh, a protest in front of a government building. Um, they identify an individual or individuals that appear to be agitators within the crowd. Um, they will then be given several options. Do you contact the individuals? Do you leave them alone, uh, et cetera? You have different choices. Based on those choices, um, they would then have a result. And it would be very visual to where you could see an increase from the protest being peaceful to then becoming an issue of property damage or um, other officers being assaulted with rocks or bottles, et cetera. So uh, if they chose to engage early on, that may have solved the issue, or now if it escalates, they would have other issues to deal with and so forth. And then if you move into an issue with uh, domestic violence or something related to vandalism, et cetera. And this is where I think you would see this um, have many opportunities for law enforcement, uh, where it's not only at the community-based policing level, but and it is an advanced training module to where in your agency, you can take this and have this for a uh, plethora of ideas on um, reoccurring training or annual training that needs to occur uh, and so forth and be able to visualize this and make it more engaging. So um, Ted, you and I have had previous conversations about how 
um, in my experience uh, with our academy in the U.S., um, it, at times it was difficult, you know, to, to, to get the interest of a, a captive audience, so to speak. Um, but with something like this, you wouldn't necessarily have to have them physically present at your location. You could have this delivered anywhere throughout the agency or even at home if you allowed it. Um, and then be able to have some level of increased interest based on what it is that you design. And again, it can go from something like we talk about here with community policing to cybersecurity, you name the topic. It's a, I think, a very customizable solution where um, it's only limited by your imagination. Well, well Frank, um, um, no, go ahead. No, no, no that's, that, that's, that, that was one of the key points I wanted to point out. I think that, were, that, that was relevant to the topic of your uh, platform, Ted, is that um, you know, our, our serious gaming and both the, that and the training for the officers is something that when you look at a uh, project that spans the continent of Europe, uh, we have to have remote delivery on that. And we have to be able to um, provide us with as limited face-to-face uh, -face contact as possible at some stage in the project. And I think um, the possibilities for the final solution, I think are limitless when it comes to what you could have for um, a wider uh, 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 law enforcement or government uh, platform. Well, well, Frank, this this has been wonderful, and one of the the closing comments that I would make uh, b beyond a, a sincere thanks for sharing your world class expertise on what I would call cyber crime and you know digital uh, law enforcement expertise, but your point about uh, governments globally can basically uh, collaborate with you and adopt these, um, you know, state-of-the-art approaches, which actually creates an opportunity for citizen engagement at a, what I would call internet scale um, uh, approach. So Frank, that, this has been fascinating. I'm, I'm so glad I, uh, I was able to uh, convince you to speak in our series, Frank. No, uh, Ted, thanks for, ha for having me. It's been a pleasure, and I'd be happy to do so again. Well, thanks so much, Frank, and thanks uh, for folks tuning in. And this, uh, this presentation, Frank, will be posted on our partner's uh, YouTube channel on the Municipal Climate Change Action Center uh, YouTube channel. Fantastic. Excellent. Thanks so much, Frank. Take, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.